What is up fellow car enthusiasts? My name is Eric, this is Gridline Go, and today, like I had mentioned in my previous video when I was in the gorgeous Alabama hills, I'm gonna do a full walk around of my 1999 Honda Passport for you guys, a little bit more in depth. I know I covered it previously when I introduced it, but this is gonna be a little bit more uh, part number type stuff. So this is my 1999 Honda Passport, uh, which I nicknamed the Doozy because it was in an accident and it was nicknamed the Honduzu and then cut short for Doozy, which you saw in the previous video and I named it rightfully the Honduzu. Got a proper sticker for it right where, the, where it would say Passport or Rodeo because uh, this is also on an Isuzu Rodeo chassis. Honda bought part of the rights to sell it as one of their own. Um, so they did this for a few years. This is the second generation, and then they stopped after this. They didn't do much because Honda didn't have a SUV at the time to be competing. The Vigor was just released and wasn't doing very well. So they thought, hey, we should probably get into the SUV game, and they ended up with the first generation Honda Passport, and this is the second generation itself. So what I have done to it in, in its entirety is the first thing I did was I lifted it, uh, which makes it really nice and easy for these because you can get a semi-free lift, which it has torsion bars. So torsion bars actually make it really nice and easy to bring the front end up only at least the front by turning this one bolt here. By doing that, you actually turn the bar itself which pushes down the control arm, which brings the truck back up, and you can get yourself essentially a free lift. So I did that, I brought it up about three to four inches or so just to fit uh, my tires. And then in the rear, in the rear, I did Old Man Emu, uh, which is like an ARB, I guess. Uh, ARB's Old Man Emu's 912 lift springs, which were generally made for the Trooper. Um, so it fit the trooper, but it actually fits inside here too, uh, which was really, really nice, uh, considering the axle is pretty much the same. So it has a higher load range spring for when I do load, uh, weigh it down when I'm heading out camping or off-roading with some gear and stuff like that. And then I fit it with, uh, taller pro comp shocks to allow for that extra travel. Because of the 33s, you do also get some clearance issues, so you have to install bump stop extensions, which those ones I ended up making myself from some extra uh, trailer hitch receivers. And in order to help that, you do have to get an extended brake line, which I didn't do. I went the cheap route, and I had some extra metal made an extended bracket just to bring that up a little bit. So when I am flexing or on full droop, when I lift up the car, I'm not stretching that brake line uh, all the way out and not damaging it. Um, and then to get a little bit more lift to help, I also installed a coil spring spacer. It was a one inch. Uh, that was from Independent 4x. Uh, they actually have a pretty good selection of aftermarket parts and stuff like that. It's pretty sweet. Um, so that way I have a total of about four inches, I guess, uh, of lift. Um, and then to assist this is the biggest flaw with the rear axle design of these is the, the fuel tank is actually right there the fuel tank is not in the most <laughs> best not in the best location it would be best if it was maybe here behind the axle kind of like the troopers or the first generation rodeos or passports um, so what you end up having end up having to do is you have to get a bent upper link to avoid the fuel tank to uh, on full droop. You'll actually hit the fuel tank when you're bring, coming down. And back here you have a Dana 44, which a lot of Jeeps actually end up taking out of these rodeos and passports because it is an LSD. It is a good differential. It is a good axle to be using and off-roading with. 
and fits perfectly apparently so and it's coil sprung so it's nice so a little bit more further with this walk around these wheels and tires are actually pretty nice these are the bfg ko2 all terrains which are probably one of the better uh, all terrains you can get on the market today um, and i would say that i have had zero zero issue with these things uh, since i've had them i've scuffed them up on rocks already which has been pretty good i have no major issues with the uh, cuts um, other than something that i self-inflicted myself um, you can kind of see on the tires itself here on the edges when i didn't put those bump stop extensions it actually went up and hit the, the body and that would be slicing the tire just on the shoulder itself um because there's not much room on these cars for uh, 33 inch tires so these are 33 by 12 and a half by 15 uh, tires which is pretty much the i guess the standard rule of thumb off-roading size tire that you want to necessarily have is about a 33 um, and then on, for the wheels, I have Pro Comp Rock Crawler 51 Series 15 by 8 with uh, offset of 0 or backspacing of 4 inches, which puts it right in the middle, which do sit these out pretty wide, um, which is a good and bad thing all at the same time <laughs> because they're a little bit wider, so you don't be, you're not hitting the frame and you're not hitting, uh, if you had them, sway bars, which I pulled these ones off. Um, or even the body when you're turning or entirely flexing. By having the wider tire, you are avoiding a lot of that, which helps a little bit. But having a 33 in its entirety, you do get some clearance issues in the fender liner. As you can see here, I did do some cutting, did some uh, some trimming that I had to do, and then back here, which ignore the paint missing and rust because that's fine. It'll go away eventually. <laughs> uh, I had to do an extensive amount of hitting and cutting just to fit these back here and they still rub every once in a while. So you can see the uh, the pinch weld that I, I smashed in to bring in a little bit. Get some avoidance. And then also on full compression you can, I'll, I'll, I'll hit up here every once in a while. I do hit back here a little bit. You can still kind of see some, some rubbing and stuff. Um, this was one of the more bigger issues here and the pinch welds back there which I ended up just smacking away and folding them over inwards to get more clearance. As far as the fender liners, I pretty much just cut it up and made it work. <laughs> and then back here with these 33s, this is where I was saying where I was actually hitting. You could see some, you could see some slicing and some cutting because on full articulation, it goes up into the body in which I ended up also hitting away at and folding to get out of the way. Um, likewise here, I did the same thing here, um, just to kind of make it work. I pulled this all out. I pulled the, there's a plastic seal that sits here, which I took off and folded out, but wasn't too bad of an issue because the door still closes quite nicely. Um, and I also did some more hitting here to avoid. And then back here, I haven't had much of an issue. And I think part of that is because I have that bent upper link that is from Darlington Off-Road. I actually still have my mud flap from doing the Cleghorn on this side because it actually pulled it in a little bit more. Where on the other side, it pushed it out the factory link. So you can see here now on this side, uh, this has the factory link side where uh, I don't have any issues rubbing here. But back here is where I pulled the mud flap off and ended up actually uh, folding up the body there folding it here and back here when the tire came up on compression and it ripped the mud flap right off and I just left it off since then. So I'll probably end up taking this mud flap off. I do want to get a rear bumper kind of fabbed up for this thing. Um, but I'm, as far as I'm concerned, I feel like the upper link that I changed on this side probably had something to do with the uh, travel because this has a shorter distance and that one has a little bit longer distance because that's the only modification I made on that side. So it's all factory links pretty much. It's just like kind of propped back up a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and I want to do something with this dangling exhaust because I know I'm going to fold it one day on a rock because of the departure angle kind of is affected by that. So I'll probably end up lopping it maybe 
right about there on the exhaust hanger uh, and call it good because that would give me a much better departure angle without having to worry about that exhaust being in the way. Now for the situation that I got going up right here, I have a aftermarket uh, brush guard which I bought on Craigslist, some guy was selling. I actually ended up, was selling his rodeo, but I didn't want his rodeo. I saw that he had a brush guard and I contacted him saying, hey, uh, I don't want your rodeo, but I want that brush guard. If you're willing to sell it, I'll bite off you. And so he's like, okay. <laughs> well, so he pulled it off. I ended up going to get it and I put it on myself uh, right there and it worked out great. This was an awesome little addition. It looks like it just fits perfectly. Um, and because all off-roaders and car enthusiasts alike are pretty much broke, I went a cheap route, very cheap route, and bought this 20-inch uh, light bar off the sweet Amazon for a whole $25. Uh, and I've had zero issues with it. I've been to snow, been through mud and dirt and everything you can think of, and there is no moisture ingress at all, and it's still nice and clear, and it's super nice and bright. It's absolutely awesome. Uh, additionally, this one came with uh, fog light holes, but there wasn't any fog light in there. So it's kind of a lower end model, it seemed. So I ended up installing uh, these $7 lights from Amazon as well, uh, pulling out the little grill that they have here and mounting these up into the factory harness that actually exists. There's a factory harness that sits up in there and I made my own little connector and mounted it right where the OE fog light would fit. Um, and these were only like seven bucks and these were awesome little fog lights for like cornering or even low wide. Something that the, the light bar can't reach, these ones can because I do have them aimed out a little bit further. Um, so by having the factory harness, all I had to do was install uh, a relay and a fuse and a switch. I bought that uh, on online and installed it and everything worked perfectly, so the harnessing was great. So if you also watched my other previous video, I got a front runner roof rack, uh, which worked out really, really nicely considering they don't make one specifically for this, so I bought their universal rails. Um, so whatever this thing came off of, it just it's a little big, I would say, a little wide, but it fits pretty nicely as far as length goes uh, but I really really do enjoy this and it helped out immensely by using the factory the factory uh, rails so under here you can kind of see I guess where the screws are under here there's the two mounts that mount into the body that have the factory rails and we ended up just pulling that off entirely running these rails all along here which was our Universal 1800, I guess. I think it was the 1800s. Um, and bought, bought a few sets of feet. And then I mounted it up there and it worked great ever since. It's been so sweet compared to the basket that I had on there previously. The basket was really nice to have. So this wasn't very, this isn't very basket-like, but the, uh, the basket was nice for multiple other reasons. But as far as this goes, it, it's not loud over bumps, it's not clattering like my other one was. This is snug and to the vehicle, it's like one piece, it really makes it nice. On top here I have the same $7 fog lights that I have down there in the bumper. Uh, and I have them wired up to the switch in the back here. I hooked up a little, little switch here which is really nice, that helped out. Uh, and I ran the power from the dome light which is right here. So all I did was, out of ground, all of a sudden, get a nice bright, nice bright light on both sides. I've made it on both sides and I added a little, made a little jumper harness that goes from here all the way through to both lights. So one of my first additions to this vehicle was actually installing a first aid kit and a flashlight inside this awesome little compartment that comes with this car. So I got my first aid, got some, some, uh, some bug spray, some rope, uh, sunscreen, uh, more repel, uh, first aid kit, I got matches, I got some tourniquet stuff, you know, and, 
and a super awesome streamlight flashlight because this this streamlight flashlight actually is very popular especially because i mean i'm a technician mechanic whatever you want to call us uh, i work on cars for a living <laughs> um this is the probably the most popular uh, flashlight you would see in a technician or mechanic's hands at any shop streamlight's very popular um and i've really always been a fan of them and so i mounted the I mounted, they call it the piggyback charger, I guess. Uh, I routed a 12 volt from the other side through here in this nice little grommet. Kind of kept it clean, freshened it up a little bit. Um, and then that way I can hold my flashlight, spare battery. And I have this powered, so it's not all the time, but so it's actually only when the ignition is on itself. So here on the other side, you typically have a 12 volt socket that goes here, uh, but it was broken and I couldn't find another one and I figured it was you know, insufficient enough for my use. So I ended up buying this off the sweet Amazon. Again, it, what it is is a USB, um, USB port with a one amp and 2.1 amp. Uh, and then you also have a 12 volt uh, there. So you still get your options. And this is gonna be also on when the ignition's on, not all the time. Um, over here on the door, I end up planning on uh, taking this off and making my own little table setup, uh, and that way it will be kind of like a fold down. There's kits available, people make them mostly, I guess. That closes the door. So back here also I have the, I guess you'd call it uh, an airfoil or diffuser or a wing or a dust hat and what it really is for which people don't actually necessarily know is it collects air to, and sends it down the windshield to keep the dust off the back window helps keep everything nice and clean and organized so you don't have to worry about it All right. as far as the inside there isn't much to it entirely it's pretty much the same with the addition of uh some new speakers give a little bit more bump because this thing has like the low end kit it's got the um, cloth interior um, and it doesn't have the rear door speakers. Typically there'd be a rear door speaker if you had, uh, here, if you had a higher, uh, model. Uh, and then you also have two speakers in the back there and there, which are practically useless for up here. Um, so as far as the fog lights went, this is your little switch pack. And this is what I ended up buying. I bought just this switch and there's already the connector back there. So you just connect it to, slide it in and it works. Down here I had a blink. This was also a blink. So I ended up moving this one down here and making this my horn because this one here was broken. Um, so what I ended up doing was I rerouted it this way into this little push button here. So it's always fun to play with. Uh, typically with these high mileage vehicles, you also get these random holes right where your heel of your foot sits and then it wears out on your on the carpet so what i ended up doing was i took this marine grade type of pleather and glued it down so now it's nice and strong and together in one piece and so when that eventually wears through i'll either replace it or just put another piece on top of it <laughs> so not too long ago the doozy had a birthday 200k i installed a cobra 29 ltd updated with a bluetooth which is kind of nice uh so I can do Bluetooth phone calls through it. Um, I got a little microphone up in here. I can do my phone calls and stuff like that through it with it. Um, additionally, I added a little PA system, which was so cool and just an absolute dork with stuff like this. I like to accessorize. That was it beeping. So it's fun. And I just mounted it right to the top of the dash there uh, with a uh, with the screws and a little nut and a washer on the backside to kind of keep it nice and steady. Uh, but it bounces around. My volume keys go up when I, when I drive sometimes, it just hits the volume and turns up the radio. Um, I didn't install this myself. This was already installed when I bought the car. As far as these AC systems go, this is super typical for this to just, the dial to fail because inside are gears um, and the plastic stuff just breaks apart and gets old. Um, kind of like that so eh. um 
So I got to replace that again for like the fourth time. This is probably the fourth one I've gone through. Uh, and they're kind of annoying with the cables because they got little eclipse that hold the cables together in there and it's just, it's just a mess. All right, anyways. Um, so as far as my light bar goes, that's where I have my switch. I've got the switch down here for it. Um, so I also want to put, I want to put a, like an, an OCP here, an overhead control panel for my, the light bar, for the fog lights, uh, for the lights on the back. That would be nice. And then I stole this mirror from the donor vehicle as well because it has um, little dome lights on it, mirror lights, and the other one didn't. And I just wired it up to the dome light here. So as far as under the hood goes, there really isn't much to it. Small little 3.2 liter V6 engine, dual rig cam, which packs a whopping 205 horsepower when it's brand new. Probably not now that it's got 200,000 miles on it. It's probably all worn out and tired now. Uh, I'm gonna do the timing belt eventually. Probably, probably should do that sooner than later. I don't know where the kind of conditions that it in. I haven't even taken it apart to even look. Um, so as far as everything else goes, this is pretty much a Azuzu. I have the uh, the PA mounted here with the PA speaker that I have mounted here, which I'll probably end up relocating and putting uh, an air compressor here for airing up and airing down, whatever, do all that cool off-road stuff. Um, and because this is actually a nice little section for it. So that's really, really about it. The only other thing is, the only other thing is I've been battling that fella right there. I keep getting O2 codes. Um, ever since the California city trip, if you saw that, um, me and JD push these things pretty hard. So that's it guys. This is my 1999 Honda Passport in depth with, um, some battle scars and some more and endeavors to encounter. Uh, this thing really is kind of still getting off its feet and getting the kinks worked out. So thanks for watching. I guess our next journey here is to go to Rower Flats, which is in Santa Clarita. It's a little bit north of Los Angeles area. Uh, apparently there's a really nice uh, trail over there called Lookout Trail. It's supposed to be one of the better, uh, harder trails to do. Um, and I'm really excited to see how this thing does now that I put those bump stop extensions on and I won't be locking up the wheel inside the fender. So that's all right. I'm working with it and I'm having fun. So stick around for our other videos. Thanks for watching.